Alright people, buckle up because you're about to hear every nitpick, every awful creative choice, every admirable creative choice, all the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to the controversial yet very, very financially successful Disney live action remakes of their classic animated films. I sat down and watched every single one, including Maleficent and Alice in Wonderland and Cruella, even though they aren't even directly adapting their animated counterparts, they're more so twists on the tales, but they often get lumped in with the rest of the films, so whatever, they'll be included. This was all in preparation for Disney's live-action adaptation of The Little Mermaid, which will make or break the future of Disney live-action, because even though people love to complain about them, they've always shown up to the theater and given them the benefit of the doubt. The more recent films have been particularly lackluster, and audiences have been burned one too many times. The Disney live-action fatigue is really becoming too much for most people, especially with Disney having announced so many more to come, including the absolutely insane, unhinged announcement of a live-action Moana. If The Little Mermaid gets a disappointing reception from audiences, I think many people will completely give up on these films and stop tuning in, but I'm optimistic, as there has never been a more exciting, perfect casting than Halle Bailey as Ariel, so hopefully the movie around her will deliver, fingers crossed. Um, okay, let's talk about the movies I watched, and I'm exhausted from watching them. Uh, I started Where It All Began. No, not Alice in Wonderland, though that is the film that is responsible for the modern wave of live-action films. The very first was 1996's 101 Dalmatians. Don't bring up 1994's The Jungle Book because that was not associated with the animated film in any way. 101 Dalmatians may have been an absolute childhood favorite of mine, one I had on repeat, but I am someone who is able to remove my rose-tinted nostalgia glasses and evaluate something through more reasonable adult eyes, so when I sat down to rewatch this, I let go of all bias and observed with as much objectivity as I could. And since the critical reception for this film has never been very good, I was on the lookout for weak points. So the approach they were going for here was to directly adapt the 1961 animated film into the medium of live action, and what I mean by this is not that the film is shot by shot the same as the animated movie, but the bones of the animated film were translated into the real world. They were adapted into reality, a very heightened, mostly illogical version of reality, but reality nonetheless. The intent was to experience the beloved film in a more real way, embracing the idea that an animated movie can get away with things that you can't in live action, and a live action film has the responsibility to make everything more tangible by making what was two-dimensional, three-dimensional, including the story and characters and whatnot, providing more detail and depth, fleshing out the elements, and while this film isn't aimed specifically at adults, it naturally takes on a more mature, darker approach when blending the original film into a more grounded, modern world. And yes, that means the animals don't speak in the movie, even if they do still have humanistic behaviors, but that's the whole point. It's experiencing the animated film from an alternative perspective, and that's why I think this particular adaptation functions as a companion piece to the animated film and why as a child, I never preferred one film over the other because they were different experiences of the same thing. I never ever thought of the live action film as a replacement of the original, it was never trying to outdo the original, it didn't want you to forget the original, they existed together hand in hand, side by side, as the same property being handled according to their respective mediums. And that's what I think a live action adaptation should be. It should be a different way of experiencing something, in the way adapting a book into a movie or a movie into a stage play offers a new way to experience a story. 
And yes, live action and animation are both within the medium of film and should be viewed equally, but they both can offer different things. And the general public has begun viewing these Disney live action films as if they're intending to be the new, improved versions that update the quote unquote aged, outdated originals because the filmmakers think those movies are old and irrelevant. And that's definitely the attitude a lot of these more recent adaptations seem to have. But 101 Dalmatians began the idea of Disney live action adaptations with a very different goal, to give you the option to experience a beloved classic in a new way. And I don't think that does any harm. It's innocent and fun, and that's why I don't think live action adaptations are inherently evil, and I'm more open-minded than most people. When it comes to Disney live action, and it's because this film introduced to me at a very young age what each medium could provide. But like I said, this film was not well received by critics, so does it hold up for me in terms of quality? While I do think the slapstick moments and wacky bits, particularly throughout the final act, do clash with the film's more grounded tone, at least in comparison to the animated movie, and they just feel like a result of writer-producer John Hughes wanting to capitalize off his success with the Home Alone films. The film is actually very good in a surprising way that I've only now just picked up on, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody else bring this up, so I'll get to that, but I want to talk about the basics first. Though the film is missing the bouncing, colorful, 60s energy of the animated version, it does take the charming whimsy of it and allows a darker, moodier, more deliciously menacing atmosphere to manifest when grounding the tone, and it's supported by very distinctive, strong art direction. The costume and set design are grand, sleek, elegant, intimidating, yet still playful, particularly when it comes to Cruella de Vil and her habitats. The musical score also contributes so perfectly. Glenn Close takes an already iconic character and makes her even more iconic by giving the most unhinged, off the rails, brilliantly insane performance possible. Since the dogs don't speak in this version, that means the villain gets to be the main character, which could have been a tricky task, but you just can't take your eyes off of Glenn Close here. She's absolutely chewing the scenery, she completely goes for it, and it's just delicious to watch. You truly love to hate her, and even though she's a funny character, she has several genuinely spine-tingling moments. One that stands out is when she says to herself that she'll soon be wearing Anita's dogs, and then she lets out the most deranged cackle you've ever heard in your entire life, and it truly just gives me chills. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> and her performance is perfectly supported by the framing and composition of the cinematography and the eerie music that intensifies to create what I think is the greatest moment in the film. And the nuances they've added to the character are spectacular. I don't think people realize that this was the very first time that Cruella was depicted as working in the fashion industry, which makes so much sense for the character that everybody now knows that as Cruella's occupation. They even used that idea in the Emma Stone Cruella origin story movie, so this film contributed quite a bit to the legacy of the character, which I think is exactly what a Disney live action film should do. It should build and expand upon what was already established and strengthen the character within culture. Build on the legacy instead of try to erase it. Anyway, Cruella ruling a fashion empire not only explains why she's an eccentric, egotistical fashionista with a lot of power and money, but it also helps naturally explore her fascination with authentic animal fur. I love the detail added about how she hired her henchmen to poach a rare Siberian tiger from the zoo because she was obsessed with its fur and just had to have it. 
this element helps lay the groundwork of who she is and what she's capable of and also makes the film more mature and sinister. And even though I've seen the film countless times, this is where I picked up on a surprisingly brilliant, nuanced theme that is woven throughout. The film is essentially about how animals are more intellectually complex and emotionally aware than humans like to believe they are. Humans tend to disregard the psyche of animals, the feelings of animals, the intelligence of animals, so that they can enjoy their hamburgers and fur coats without guilt. Though the exaggerated behaviors of the animals in the film can be a bit unrealistic, the point is to highlight that animals are more capable than we realize. There are also pieces of dialogue throughout the film that emphasize this message, but what really hammers the message home is the final act, when Cruella is delivering a very sinister monologue to the barn animals. At this point, we've just spent the entire film falling in love with all the adorable animals and also have just seen them outsmart the human villains and take them down, but even though Cruella has been fooled by the animals, she's laughing as she tells them that their only worth is for becoming food and fashion. The only reason for their existence is for human benefit. And it's shocking how hard this hit me during this viewing. It's disturbing, and it's true about the role of animals in our society, so it should make audiences feel horrid. And I think this is exactly the kind of thematic depth that a live-action, more realistic, more grounded adaptation should take. And it's exactly the kind of thing that makes it stand on its own as a companion piece and an alternative version to the original that doesn't contradict it, but gives a more layered, multi-dimensional experience. I have more movies to get to, so these are just the main points I have regarding the film, but despite some overly goofy moments, I think this film is misunderstood, overlooked, underrated, and unfairly judged. I love it, and even if not perfect, it's the blueprint for what a Disney live-action adaptation should aim for. Okay, I have to move on. I'm surprised the financial success of 101 Dalmatians didn't start its own trend of Disney live-action adaptations because the next one didn't come out until 2010 with Tim Burton's Alice in Wonderland. Even though this film is not even technically an adaptation or a remake, and I actually don't even have proof that it's based on Disney's animated film at all. It is what kickstarted the recent trend of Disney live-action movies, so I have to include it. So, the approach this movie takes is that it's a sequel to the basic general story of Alice in Wonderland, not specifically the animated film or the book because it contradicts both. Yeah, much like the titular character, this movie is a little confused. It doesn't really know exactly what it is or what it wants to be. It takes the general elements of Alice in Wonderland and follows adult Alice returning to Wonderland, or as the characters call it, Underland, and instead of utilizing Lewis Carroll's deliberately nonsensical approach, Tim Burton just applies a conventional hero's journey slash prophecy slash chosen one narrative to it, and it just falls flat. Conceptually, Tim Burton's weird, twisted, imaginative mind seems like it would be an absolute perfect fit for an Alice in Wonderland movie, which is why I think this made a billion dollars despite a lackluster reception from critics and audiences. Even if there is some entertainment value and intrigue within the more dreary, bleak, gothic fantasy, it really doesn't take advantage of its potential. The chocolate room in Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory has a stronger Wonderland aesthetic than the drab, miserable, CGI, green screen, video game atmosphere of this film. It's so lifeless and digital and woefully lacks the whimsical, witty, mystical, colorful wonder of the animated version. Speaking of the animated version, 
This live action film completely ignores Disney's iconic beloved history with this title, and instead of expanding and building upon its legacy, it seems as if it just wants to completely override it. I understand when translating animation into live action you have to adapt certain elements to fit the medium and what works best for it, and you adjust things accordingly, but this film doesn't just have its own take on the classic characters, it completely starts from the ground up. And like, why wouldn't you do that with a different studio? What makes this Disney's Alice in Wonderland? Any other studio could have produced this exactly as is with no changes. I don't understand why Disney wouldn't embrace what only they have the legal right to do with the property. I don't understand why, when bringing Alice in Wonderland back to the big screen in a grand way, they wouldn't pay respect to their history with the title. Just doesn't sit right with me, especially because most of the new designs look cheap, silly, and unappealing. I like the Cheshire Cat though, and I like the river of floating heads that the Queen has offed. That was surprising to see in a PG-rated Disney film, but... Yeah, this film is mostly just a major wasted opportunity that I still kind of have fun watching even though it's objectively not good. Moving on to 2014's Maleficent. Now this is also technically not an adaptation of the film it's based on, Sleeping Beauty. It's more of a twist on the story telling it through the villain's perspective and actually not making her a villain at all, but I'll get to that. Uh, this was the film that came out between the revisionist Alice in Wonderland and the very traditional Cinderella, and that definitely shows because it is a different take on the story, but unlike Alice in Wonderland, it still is very clearly based on its animated counterpart and utilized the iconography from it. Before this film came out, I think most people were expecting it to be simply the origin story of Maleficent, and that it would show us why she was so wicked, why she was the greatest Disney villain of them all, and I was hyped. It was a perfect opportunity to expand on an iconic character that we still don't know much about and once again build on her legacy, contribute to who she is within our culture. But the film turned out to not be the origin story of the best Disney villain, it turned out to be a film that claims she's not a villain at all and our whole lives are a lie. The character is transformed completely into a sympathetic hero, which worked for the Wicked Witch of the West in the book and Broadway musical Wicked because they were working with the public domain general idea of the character, while Maleficent is specifically a Disney creation, and this is Disney telling her story. Angelina Jolie is pitch perfect as Maleficent, but I wish I could see her actually be bad and evil, and she doesn't even turn into a dragon, which was like the coolest thing about the animated character other than her green skin, which is also missing here. The most distinctive, iconic aspects of the character have been erased. Had this film played out exactly as it did within the first two thirds, and then went on to be like, and now she's bad, I would actually probably like this movie, but... It still just really rubs me the wrong way. It has some nice, grand, epic visuals, though they're nowhere near as strikingly beautiful as the visuals from the animated Sleeping Beauty, which I think is Disney's most visually beautiful film. Yeah, I actually remember liking the sequel, Maleficent Mistress of Evil, a tad bit more, and no, I didn't rewatch any of the live action sequels for this video, but. That film, I remember, did a tiny bit of course correcting, even though Maleficent still wasn't a villain, and it was very flawed, but I had more fun with it. But Maleficent isn't a, a terribly made film, I just think it makes some very, very questionable decisions that hinder it. 
Okay, so moving on to what many consider to be the best Disney live action film, and I probably would have to agree, 2015's Cinderella. In a time where it seemed as if we would only be getting lackluster revisionist takes on Disney classics, Cinderella was refreshingly traditional and straightforward, and most critics and audiences were delighted by it. Though 101 Dalmatians was also a faithful adaptation, and that was 20 years prior, Cinderella was the first straightforward adaptation within this new wave of Disney live actions. And though this is probably my favorite of the bunch, and definitely the one I revisit frequently, I also oddly have way more nitpicks than I do with most of them. But I do tend to have more nitpicks when something is so close to greatness than I do when something is just a complete train wreck. Which I might contradict later, because I have a lot to say about some films that are really bad. Um, but this film's highs are very, very high. The most successful aspect of this film is just the irresistible magic of it all. It's truly enchanting and almost impossible to not get swept up into. The film exudes dazzling beauty in every frame. Costume designer Sandy Powell provides my favorite costumes of any film ever. They're just dripping with fantasy, extravagance, personality, detail, color, and are just so striking. They're complemented beautifully by the ornate, warmly lit production design to create eye-popping, painterly visuals. Also, it has the most gorgeous dance sequence I've ever seen, not just because of the aforementioned costumes and set design, though those are definitely a factor. The palpable chemistry between Lily James and Richard Madden is captured both intimately and sweepingly with the beautiful cinematography. It's breathtaking, and Lily James is the perfect Cinderella. She absolutely embodies the warmth elegance and charm of the character, even though they've written her to be less spunky and more passive than her animated counterpart, which is strange because they're framing it as if she is a more feminist take on the character just because she meets the prince before falling in love with him at the ball, yet she endures the abuse of her stepfamily for the sake of kindness and says she doesn't leave because she's taking care of her parents' house, instead of highlighting the fact that she was a victim of abuse and had nowhere to go, and at the end of the movie, she simply accepts her fate in the attic instead of trying to claw her way out, but I don't mean to get into my nitpicks already. Kate Blanchett is also perfectly cast as Lady Tremaine, and she gives the character a bit more dimension, even though I prefer the more quietly sinister, calmly, casually evil demeanor of the animated character. I think she still feels like the character, and I love the intimidating fashionista addition that's brought to the character to further amplify the idea that she's envious of youth and beauty. And she gets some of the best costumes in the entire film. I just have to nitpick a little. I wish she had gray hair. I wish she had gray hair, or at least hair that was going gray throughout the film, because after all, this isn't just generic public domain wicked stepmother, this is Lady Tremaine, a character created specifically for Disney's version of Cinderella, and I think she should at least be somewhat recognizable as the character and keep some of the distinguishable elements. If I were to take it a step further, I'd have the color palette of most of her costumes be burgundy, dark reds, and purples instead of green, but the hair is more important to me. And that brings me to Helena Bonham Carter's depiction of the fairy godmother. While I think her narration is so wonderfully cozy and delightful, I'm pretty ambivalent on the depiction of the actual character of the fairy godmother. She's still bumbling and forgetful like the animated one, and I don't actively dislike this version, but the character works so much better as a sweet, nurturing, grandmother-like figure. How perfect would it have been if Julie Andrews played the fairy godmother? She's a Disney legend, is associated with classic Disney, and has such a gentle, warm, charming nature to her that would have worked so much better than Helena Bonham Carter's quirky, eccentric, youthful take. 
I mean, I do like Helena Bottom Carter, but this take on the Fairy Godmother should have been saved for another studio's version of Cinderella and not Disney's. Um, another thing that bothers me, which I actually made a whole video about, is that in post-production, they digitally changed Cinderella's gorgeous, ethereal, icy periwinkle dress to a garish, ugly, oversaturated blue color, and I rant about that in my other video, so check that out. So, other than making the character of Cinderella more passive in this version, my main nitpicks primarily have to do with the filmmakers ignoring some of the essential iconography of the animated film, whether that be in the looks of some of the characters, or even in the castle, which is completely different from the iconic Cinderella castle that literally is Disney's main image, their central landmark, so it's an odd choice to not include it in their definitive live-action Cinderella film, but yeah, it's mostly little stuff like that that kind of bothers me, and speaking of missing iconography, this is one of the only Disney live-action adaptations to not include the beloved music from its animated counterpart. This isn't a musical, which actually kind of works in its favor as it's more grounded, more focused on the story and human characters, and is generally just translating the story into real life, but when Ella sings the lullaby her mother taught her, why was she not singing A Dream Is A Wish Your Heart Makes? Why was it not that song? Like, even though this isn't a musical, they're still singing, and what's being sung could have easily been A Dream Is A Wish Your Heart Makes, and I would have instantly forgiven every other nitpick. And also, I would have loved to see the Sing Sweet Nightingale bubble sequence in live action, that would be gorgeous. And So This Is Love is one of the most romantic, underrated Disney songs, so I really wish that was there. I wish the songs were incorporated in some way in the actual film rather than the end credits, but this was the first faithful adaptation of the new wave, so I'll forgive it. If this film were made today, though, they definitely would have included the music. At the end of the day, this may not be the perfect way to approach a live-action companion piece to an iconic animated movie, but overall, I think it's the most successful of the bunch. It truly is, um, somehow, despite all of my nitpicks with it. Um, it's just gorgeous. Okay, so next, I rewatched 2016's The Jungle Book. I remember crying in the theaters watching this because even though this also wasn't a musical, they found a way to incorporate the most iconic songs from the animated film, and that really tugged at my nostalgic heartstrings. I can't say it still has the same effect because back then it was a new, exciting thing to see the beloved music come back on the big screen. And now it's the standard for every Disney live action, and I'm getting desensitized. And overall, I do enjoy this film, but not as much as I did when it was first released. Now, where Jungle Book has an advantage over the other Disney remakes is that the original film has a more fluid, episodic, meandering structure, and doesn't have many specific plot points it needs to hit, so there's so much more room for a live-action film to build upon it and provide lots of new material while still including all of the essential beloved elements, so you inherently get a natural mix of new and old. And not every Disney live-action film gets that luxury, because they have specific story beats and iconic moments they have to cover. The Jungle Book utilized groundbreaking technology to explore, expand upon, and celebrate the original film while still standing on its own. It's very respectful of the animated film, yet it's also a completely different experience. My biggest issue is actually the aesthetic of the film. While most of the CGI looks photorealistic, the overall visual look is really lacking that vibrant, mystical, jungly energy, and it often looks just like a generic forest in Middle America. But as we will discuss later, director Jon Favreau loves a bland, lifeless aesthetic. I also don't like the new take on King Louis. I think 
Christopher Walken was a great casting choice, but where King Louis' presence in the original was a jovial, bouncy, swinging good time, this King Louis is just a giant orangutan sitting in dark, dank, dingy, ancient ruins, and while The Bare Necessities was very organically woven into the film, King Louis singing I Wanna Be Like You was approached in a much less natural way. I just can never fully enjoy the King Louis sequences. I also wish Baloo looked more like an actual sloth bear, rather than a basic brown bear, because sloth bears are much more distinctive, interesting, and have more character, and he would look more like the animated Baloo that way. And even though the animals here are photorealistic, I think for the most part they're quite expressive and emote a decent amount, which can't be said for Jon Favreau's other remake, which we will discuss later, but yeah, I like The Jungle Book, it's a partial slay for sure. Okay, next I revisited 2017's Beauty and the Beast, and the initial enchantment of seeing it in theaters has definitely worn off. There were very apparent flaws when watching it in theaters, but the nostalgia and magic was so strong for me that I was able to ignore them and just allow myself to be swept away. This was the first Disney live action adaptation to be a full on musical, and that definitely makes sense. I mean, how can you make a Beauty and the Beast movie without the iconic musical numbers? And seeing them brought to life was honestly very emotional for me, but. Now that time has passed, I can really see how they half-assed this movie and wasted a lot of potential. When adapting the original animated Beauty and the Beast into live action, you're working with a much tighter, less impressionistic, less meandering story than the films that had previously been adapted, so it's more difficult to naturally expand on it and take creative liberties that feel organic especially when all the music is being included. So when you don't truly put in the effort, thought, and attention into making it successful on its own, then it just ends up being way too similar of an experience to the animated film, but a bloated, lesser version of it. And this is where the live action films sort of took a turn and realized they could just take the script for an animated film and add little unnecessary embellishments and modern adjustments and call it a day. Even though Cinderella is very similar to its animated counterpart, I don't think there's one line of dialogue that's directly lifted from the original. And of course, in Beauty and the Beast, there are some iconic lines that need to be included, but they really should have just approached the film in a way where you genuinely get to experience the story in a more complex, mature, layered, sophisticated way, rather than just regurgitating the animated film but fixing plot holes and making Belle more feminist than she already was. and. Like I said, I don't think these films should be contradicting the animated films or doing anything radically revisionist, but it'd be nice if they embrace animation and live action as different mediums, different ways to tell a story rather than one being superior to the other and being inherently more sophisticated just because it's with real people. But despite all the added nonsense, the live-action Beauty and the Beast is less sophisticated and emotionally intelligent than the animated film. Significantly so. I can't get into all the examples, there are plenty of video essays out there that compare the two films and highlight why the animated film is so much more powerful, but one example I can think of is all the little decisions and moments that make the romance convincing in the animated movie and non-existent in the live-action one. In the animated film, the Beast often feels guilty for letting his temper get the best of him. There are plenty of moments that show that he is just a softy and a nice guy under all that beastliness, and Belle brings out the good in him. In the live-action film, there is no good to be brought out of him. He is 
such a dick. He constantly condescends Belle, scoffs at her, never shows remorse, and instead of gifting her his library as an affectionate, thoughtful gesture, he just does it as an afterthought when he is showing off all his books. He has no redeeming qualities, and they have no chemistry together, partially because of that, but also because the CGI on the Beast is absolutely atrocious and distracting in a film where the CGI is otherwise quite solid. They really should have gone practical, or at least a blend of practical and CGI. Other than that, Emma Watson is horribly miscast as Belle. On paper, she sounds like a good fit because she is an intelligent, outspoken, brown-haired young woman who we've seen being a castle bookworm in the Harry Potter films, but in reality, she doesn't have the charisma or singing abilities that the film requires, and she is just way too bland, lifeless, one-note, and auto-tuned to hell and back. And the way she tried so hard to make Belle be an active princess and it resulted in her wearing this cheap, underwhelming, yellow cheese flap dress when this was supposed to be the most breathtaking, extravagant moment of the film. If you're getting ready for a dance, why would you be thinking, oh, I better wear a dress that'll be convenient just in case I have to ride a horse later? Especially after the grandeur of Cinderella's gown, this just lacks all fantasy. I actually could go on with all the complaints I have with this film, like the designs of Mrs. Potts and Lumiere, as well as the pointlessness of the magical traveling book, but I'll just say this has some poor creative decisions and is ultimately underwhelming, but a bit enchanting, to be honest. Uh, next, I watched Christopher Robin. And since this isn't a direct adaptation of a particular story, it tells an original story with the beloved Winnie the Pooh characters, I'll keep it brief, but I like this one. It's delightful, I think more Disney live action films should take this approach of utilizing the iconic characters within new stories, instead of just retelling stories they've already told, because for the most part they don't know how to do that successfully. Christopher Robin really justifies being live action with its melancholic, adult-focused approach that really highlights the sadness of reality and losing childhood wonder, and the gloomy aesthetic is also justified. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one. It was cute and sad, and yeah. Next, I revisited Dumbo. Conceptually, the approach here is a good direction to go. The original Dumbo is so simple and impressionistic that I actually think it's a good idea that the live action film retold the whole original story within the first act, and then expanded upon it from there like a sequel would. The problem is, the way they retold the story in the first act was not very effective, and the way they expanded on the story in the rest of the film was weak as well. The film takes the approach of 101 Dalmatians and Cinderella in the fact that the animal characters don't speak and there's a focus on the human characters, which, like I said before, I think is a good approach for creating an alternative experience that is grounded in live action, but the human characters here are so flat and hollow and boring and the script is so mediocre that it really prevents the film from successfully building on and celebrating the legacy of Dumbo. I actually love the design for Dumbo because it looks like what Dumbo would look like in the real world. He has personality and he can emote, but he also feels real and not too cartoony. I actually liked the trailers for the film more than the film itself, and I remember getting emotional during the trailer, so something was severely wrong when I never got emotional during the actual film. A huge culprit is the editing of the film, which is so rapid and full of jarring, quick cuts as if we're watching an action sequence when we're just watching an intimate moment. This makes the pacing feel off, the scenes never feel as if they're naturally building off one another, and we are never able to get invested. 
There are no emotional beats to take in because the camera never lingers on something for longer than a split second. So yeah, Dumbo had potential, but Tim Burton once again failed to deliver. Then, after Dumbo, I rewatched 2019's Aladdin. I was very scared for this film before it came out because everything I saw in the marketing was honestly atrocious. But like a lot of people, I was pleasantly charmed by the film. I just let it take me. I was wondering if a rewatch of this would change my mind since my expectations were so low the first time I watched it, um, that when it wasn't completely horrible I was surprised. But I can confirm that this is still pretty delightful and fun, and I even think it's really earnest. The whole film just has a charisma and energy to it that is infectious, and I think the way it expands on the original and executes memorable scenes with more nuance and detail and freshness is rather skillful and effective. But I do have negatives. I hate, hate, hate the costume design. It looks so cheap and garish and Party City Spirit Halloween-esque. The fabrics, textures, and colors are just a big eyesore, and they could have done something much more extravagant and appealing with the Middle Eastern and Indian influences. And Aladdin, where are your baggy pants? I want baggy pant Aladdin, and I want him to be wearing a purple vest, not whatever that is. The set and production design is also quite underwhelming. There is a lack of scale and scope in the sets when everything should be grand, spacious, open, towering. Like, the palace interiors are so lackluster. Where are the grand white and gold marble floors and the wide open spaces? The costumes and sets just cheapen the film a bit. Also, I still cannot for the life of me understand the casting of Jafar. I think going the younger, handsome route with the character is not an inherently poor choice as long as he's still sinister and intimidating, but this guy is so soft and it's not like he's giving a great performance or is a huge star that they used for clout, I just don't get it. It may be the worst casting choice I've seen from Disney. And also, while Naomi Scott does have a lot of charisma and charm as Princess Jasmine, it is a shame that Disney once again resorted to colorism, choosing a half-Caucasian, light-skinned actress with European features to play the first ever Disney princess of color. The animated character was the first Disney princess of color. But I've talked about that enough in other videos, so go watch those. Those are my main takeaways on Aladdin. It's much better than expected and gives you everything you'd hope for, for the most part, while still feeling fresh, but it does miss the mark in many areas. Oh, I also really love the new musical arrangements. They're really fun. Oh, okay. Ugh. Next, I watched The Lion King, and I honestly cannot talk about this very much, as I have ragged on it so much in the past. Jon Favreau really took the right approach with The Jungle Book, but here he basically just plagiarizes the original Lion King, but absolutely drains it of all its energy, artistry, and emotion. For as photorealistic as it is, it's utterly lifeless. The real Africa looks more vibrant than this. Real animals emote more than this. My dogs are very expressive, there's no excuse why these animals can't show more emotion. Anyway, this film doesn't expand on the original very much, when they could have definitely taken advantage of the more mature aspects by diving further into the Shakespearean roots of the original, which was based on Hamlet, by the way. I just... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so sick of talking about this, this movie's a waste, I need to m move on. Next, I rewatched Lady and the Tramp, which was the fourth live action adaptation to drop in 2019, but the very first one to not get a theatrical release because it was dropped as part of the launch for Disney Plus. And the film is. it's fine. It's solid for what it is. It's a modern celebration of a Disney classic. 
and it strays very close to the original and it is pretty delightful and charming to be honest even if it doesn't contribute much that's new to the title's legacy and mostly just updates it which yeah the siamese cats needed some updating but their new song is really bad it's awful and also, I know Disney would never do this, but why not acknowledge the past and show why it was wrong? I don't know exactly how they'd approach that here, but I, I don't know. It often feels that with the problematic elements, they just completely erase the history instead of giving a teaching moment. And they also did this approach with Dumbo too, just erasing the racist history of that movie, but whatever. Lady and the Tramp is an okay film. That's all I have to say. Next, I revisited a film I truly, truly despise. 2020's Mulan. I actively hate this film. It is atrocious on so many levels. I won't have the time to cover everything, but where do I start? Okay, so remember when it was announced that this film wouldn't be a musical and everyone went berserk because the songs from Mulan are so iconic and memorable and intertwined with the identity of the film? Yeah, that ended up being the least of our worries. I would have definitely loved to see the musical sequences from the original come to life. But Cinderella and The Jungle Book weren't musicals, and they were some of the best adaptations yet. And I also knew that they could still incorporate the iconic music in there somehow. But yeah, I was a little bummed to hear that Mulan wouldn't get the full-on musical treatment that the other recent films did. They made it sound as if they were wanting to do a more grounded, realistic, serious, gritty epic take on the story, so I understand to a certain degree why they wouldn't want characters bursting out in song, even though I believe that could still work. And I actually think it would be really cool if they did ultra dramatic, operatic, epic takes on the songs in the vein of something like Les Mis. That would be interesting and certainly a different experience without contradicting the Disney canon. But when they took out the songs, I expected them to be replaced with equivalent moments that represent what those songs stood for, because they actually were essential in moving the plot forward and developing the characters, especially when Mulan sings Reflection, but they just erased the songs and replaced them with nothing. No character beats or story building, they just sucked them right out. In the animated film, Mulan's reflection sequence is pivotal in telling us who the character is and how she feels and how she believes she's a disappointment and she can't do anything right after she made a fool of herself in front of the matchmaker, yet then she doesn't hesitate to risk her life for her family in a position she's completely unprepared and unqualified for. It's such an essential beat, and what happens after the matchmaker scene in the live action film to replace this moment? Nothing. They skip right to the announcement of war, and in the long run, it makes the film feel so hollow and underdeveloped, and that's just one example. Also, the excuse that this couldn't be a musical because this version is more serious and realistic and grounded. Um, this film is less realistic than the animation. There's a shape-shifting witch who turns into hundreds of hawks. The action sequences are goofy as hell the way they defy gravity, running up walls and... I know there's a nod to Asian cinema, but it's poorly handled here by white people. It's just so dumb. They could do all that crap, but they couldn't include Mushu, who is essential to the DNA and legacy of Disney's Mulan. 
And when they were marketing this movie in stores, I remember they had a bunch of Mushu merchandise mixed in with all the new stuff because he's definitely a main ingredient with the iconography of the title. So he was helping market this movie even though he wasn't in it. And no, I don't need Mushu to talk, I just want to see a cool pet dragon. They could have easily replaced that pointless phoenix with Mushu at the very least. Basically, none of the film's creative choices are justified and even on its own terms, it's a complete failure. I don't even have time to complain about the absence of Grandma and Cricky or the off-brand replacements of Sean Yu and bisexual icon Li Shang, who are so hollow and boring, or how the sister character was completely pointless and underutilized, but I do have time to talk about how awful the handling of Mulan's character was. Hiring a one-note actress with no charisma or range is a pretty pitiful start, but making Mulan a flawless superhero from the very beginning, whose arc is to not hide her true self, to not hide that she has no flaws and is naturally an expert warrior, and the obstacle she must overcome is that she has to reveal she's a woman, because you always have to be true to yourself, even if you're in a situation where you have no other choice? Huh? That is the stupidest, most baffling decision ever made in any Disney live-action adaptation. The original Mulan was so compelling because the character was not a natural warrior. She had no skills. She blindly threw herself into war with the likelihood that she wouldn't survive because she was not qualified at all but she just wanted to protect the ones she loved, and she ends up saving China not through superpowers, but through her intellect, her selflessness, her love for her family, and I'm actually getting sick to my stomach thinking about how badly they misunderstood her character. I have to move on, I'm like foaming at the mouth with... <sighs> okay, I often hear people say, yeah, that live-action Mulan was bad, but at least it was visually stunning, to which I say, it wasn't. I don't see very much cinematic value in these visuals here, at least compared to how I envision a live-action Mulan. Like, give me an epic Disney war fantasy saturated with Chinese culture, cherry blossom petals, feathery snowfall, not these bland-ass battlefields and those dry visuals. The animated film is far more epic to me, not just visually, but just compare the scene where Mulan leaves for battle. In the animated film, it's this grand, prolonged, climactic, epic moment that builds, and in the live-action film, it's a blink-and-you-miss-it moment. I honestly think a live-action Mulan has the most potential out of all the Disney live-action adaptations, but it was botched so, so terribly. I could go on for another few hours, but I'll have an aneurysm if I don't move on. Okay, next is 2021's Cruella. I was definitely scared they'd be going the Maleficent route with this one and would try to tell us that another iconic Disney villain wasn't a villain at all, when I just want to see Cruella be bad. And I had faith when I saw the trailer which looked like a Disney version of Joker and even got a PG-13 rating. When I saw the final film, it definitely wasn't as dark as I hoped it would be, Cruella was still kind of a villain, but was also frequently too nice, and not at all someone who I think would turn to making a coat of puppies, so I wish it had earned that PG-13 rating more and reminded me more of Joker than Devil Wears Prada, but it's still a very fun, energetic, 70s glam punk artistic deviation for Disney. The constant rock music was a bit overbearing, and I think a more macabre score in the place of a lot of the music choices would have contributed to a more suitable atmosphere. But yeah, 
Emma Stone is a great Cruella, and her look and voice and mannerisms are more reminiscent of the animated character than Glenn Close's, but Glenn Close still takes the cake. She's the best. One decision that bothered me, and it kind of sounds dumb, but it was the decision that Cruella was born with the two-toned black and white hair. That was stupid. Cruella definitely styled her hair that way based off her tastes. But yeah, I like this movie. Moving on. 2022's Straight to Disney Plus Pinocchio. Oh, this was real bad. The original animated Pinocchio is not only one of my favorite Disney films, but I think it's straight up the greatest Disney animated film. I think it's Walt Disney's masterpiece, and it's quite overlooked and underrated with general audiences, while most cinephiles seem to agree it's one of the greatest out there. So I think a live-action companion piece had the opportunity to really help revive appreciation for the title and add to its legacy. But with Robert Zemeckis attached as director, I was not too confident, especially after he recently made the atrocious adaptation of The Witches. And yeah, I was right to be concerned. And I fear this has driven people even further away from the animated version because this is actually a very faithful and very similar adaptation. Not to the extent of 2019's Lion King, but like that film, the artistry and integrity and emotion is sucked right out of it. Everything is played too safe, and the entire thing coasts off the greatness of the original without ever matching its power. There isn't enough expansion or exploration to build onto the legacy, and the few additions that are there are pointless, clunky, and don't enrich the material. This actually feels even more episodic than the original film. And while I appreciate the faithfulness to the original designs of the characters, they're way too cartoony and that cheapens the ambiance within a film where the production already feels straight to streaming when the animated film deserves something that is more epic and highbrow. And yeah, this is just shallow and hollow and they really replaced the Pleasure Island beer drinking with root beer? Oh god, they really missed the point, didn't they? Okay, yeah, this was disappointing. Moving on to the final film I watched, which was the newest live-action adaptation that went straight to Disney+, Plus, and I'm a little shocked that it actually feels like it went straight to Disney+, Plus because the director David Lowry is a really great filmmaker. I'm talking Peter Pan and Wendy, which was unfortunately lackluster for me. The major issue with this film is the visual look of it. The art direction is really weak here. They completely drain Neverland of its wondrous, mystical, fantasy paradise energy and instead opt for a more dull, gritty, bland aesthetic where Neverland is just lifeless landscapes. Yeah, there's not a lot of pixie dust in this thing. Most of the magic is thanks to the whimsically adventurous musical score from Daniel Hart. And this is another adaptation where most of the classic Disney iconography is absent, and it just puzzles me when Disney doesn't utilize the elements that are unique to them, that only they can use. No other studio can touch them. Yeah, I was delighted when they used the classic title card and hints of the song You Can Fly in the score, but What's the point of acknowledging Disney's legacy with Peter Pan when this thing is seemingly functioning as a complete rebrand? Even though that won't amount to anything and this will probably be forgotten. Even the 2003 Peter Pan film feels more like an adaptation of Disney's version than this does. And like 2015 Cinderella, they sing in this film, even though it's not a musical, but they don't sing songs from the animation when they easily could have. It's just confusing. And this film definitely would have benefited from keeping Peter Pan a redhead and Tinkerbell a blonde because the hair colors are part of their costumes, as petty as it sounds. 
and no one should care what shade of skin the actor who portrays the characters has, just as no one should care what shade of blonde or red their hair is, but taking away distinguishable elements that are unique to the characters gives people a reason to point to them and say, that's not Tinkerbell, that doesn't look like Peter Pan, when the reason they look different is because of the costuming and hair, not the race of the actors. But the acting in this film was, let's just say, bad, across the board. Even disappointing from Yara Shahidi, who doesn't even speak. She is just not a physical actress and does not have the pantomime skills required for the character. But if you're licking your chops at me saying something negative about this version of Tinkerbell and have a more insidious race-related reason behind that glee, just know I don't stand with you and don't think highly of you and you need to go touch some grass and don't contribute to this conversation. Okay, where I think this film really pulled through and elevated the whole experience was in its thematic approach. The film managed to extract deeper, more profound, more nuanced meaning from the fear of growing up core of the story. The way the message of this film was handled is exactly the type of complex, mature, layered, thoughtful material I want to see in a Disney live action adaptation. Too bad most everything around it is kind of weak. Which once again is a shocking thing because David Lowry is a great director. He's a great filmmaker. His film The Green Knight is one of my favorites and has some of the most gorgeous visuals I've ever seen. Okay, but now I'm done with that, let me attempt to rank all them, but they're all so different and have different functions and approaches, so it's kind of difficult and it'll be a very loose ranking, but uh, yeah, things could certainly s switch around. And this is purely off of instinct and how much the negatives outweigh the positives. But for sure, the bottom is Mulan, that's for certain. Then I guess Alice in Wonderland, though I enjoy it more than others that I'm going to rank higher. Then Dumbo, Pinocchio, The Lion King, Maleficent, Peter Pan and Wendy, Lady and the Tramp, Beauty and the Beast, Christopher Robin, Cruella, The Jungle Book, Aladdin, 101 Dalmatians, Cinderella. I don't feel 100% confident about that ranking, but I feel confident about my thoughts on each film, so yeah. It's hard to compare something so small scale like Christopher Robin to something massive like Beauty and the Beast, but Whatever, I think Christopher Robin was more successful as a film, but at the same time, it's an original story and Beauty and the Beast is not, so comparing these is just... It's tough. Anyway, that was my exhausting journey re-watching all of the Disney live-action adaptations, and I am quietly optimistic for The Little Mermaid, mostly because of Halle Bailey, but I'll let you know my thoughts on that one soon. I'm tired, and I feel delusional. I hope you stick... Th uh, stuck through this whole thing and I hope you interact like comment share because I'm in my flop era and I may just be talking to myself right now and I hope I didn't do this video for nothing well at least I got all my thoughts off my chest even though I'm gonna realize I missed some major talking points oh I just realized I did miss some stuff I really hate the color grading in Aladdin, and I think it contributes to the cheap ambiance alongside the costumes and sets. Anyway, there's more stuff like that, but I'm out for now. Okay, bye.